Are you ready to say goodbye to the constant ups and downs of the artist income roller coaster? Whether you're a full-time artist who wants to increase and stabilize your income, a part-time musician who wants to go full-time, or a hobbyist who needs to fund your passion projects, this podcast will equip you with the tools, resources, and inspiration to make it happen. My name is Bree Noble. I'm a musician, best-selling author, and educator whose mission is to help musicians like you to increase the income you're already making and tap into new income streams so you can create a more diverse, stable, reliable income from music and finally ditch the starving artist mentality. Now let's dive into The Profitable Musician Show. Welcome to the podcast. My name is Bree Noble, and I am happy to be here today with Angela Ferrari. We're going to be talking about the music industry and self-development and how you can find abundance in the music industry and not give in to that starving artist mentality. So before we get into that, uh, I would love, Angela, for you to give them a background, give them your story. What were you doing in music? How did that end up uh, coinciding with what you were doing in self-development and psychology? So it all really just came together by following my heart, not to be cheesy, but there's the path of what we're told we're supposed to do and even maybe convince ourselves that that's what we're supposed to do. And I think maybe there was an aspect of me that was a little bit of a rebel. And I feel like a lot of musicians can relate to that. And so inside of that, to be honest, I didn't view it in a logical way at all. Like, how is this going to make me survive? From a young age, I only followed the ping because maybe it was the opposite of that. It wasn't really about fame. It was about the alignment of my heart. It was about I feel alive when I do this. And I feel like I'm supposed to follow that. And so really, when you speak to tell us about self-development and all that, it's not that I was pointing to self-development. It was just my growth of what happened naturally through following the love versus following the logic. And eventually they meet. But first, there comes just a time where I feel like it's a bit of a leap of faith. Because I'll tell you this. Maybe this, not everybody can relate to this, but if you pursue the music industry for, I'll say, the reasons of maybe fame or the accolades or to be accepted or to be enough, that's a very uh, difficult journey. Yeah, no, for sure. And you may experience some of that, but it's fleeting, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So did you ever have people giving you pushback that you were pursuing music saying, you know, kind of what a lot of people say, like, how are you going to make money doing that? Like, you know, you better find another career, that kind of thing. Absolutely. You know, my parents loved me very much. And so this isn't to knock them because I can't pretend how I would respond either. But it was like, you know, Angela, let us know when you're done with this little hobby. And, you know, 401k time, corporate is the safest route. You know, let's real estate, like, what can we start getting you thinking of these other means. And truth be told, I did follow that because of fear and -hmm. because I just couldn't, I didn't align yet fully with just having my own self-acceptance. So I felt like I needed to trust in others and, and which is why I can speak the way that I speak today, because I did go the opposing path and I got to see what that felt like. And it wasn't, you know, I was actually quite successful when I dabbled in the corporate world. But I remember the moment in time where I kind of had this bird's eye view on myself and I just realized the life was being sucked out of my eyes and it didn't matter what was next. It didn't matter if there was going to be a new job or opportunity or new car from that or a new thing from that. It was, to your point, just sort of one thing after like little quick highs that were never sustaining. Mm. So that's when I, you know, despite people say not not agreeing, I left it all and pursued what I That's gutsy. And I've had that moment myself too, that, you know, you you just like, well, okay, I'm, I'm climbing the ladder, et cetera. But like, if I don't have this thing in my life that is like my deepest passion, none of that matters. Yeah, I I relate to that. And, you know, a lot of people say that they're separate. Work is work. Passion is passion. And you keep them separate because when you collide them, 
the the love for your passion starts to get sucked out of you. And I can see how that could happen to people, especially if once once again, it's wrapped inside of these other filters of this is going to make me enough. If I if, if it doesn't look this way, then it's not working. And to the point of sort of diving into the creative aspect of life or following the passion, following the heart, you don't, it's not predictable like a, like the corporate world or the cubicle might be. Yeah. And I do wonder maybe for those who tried the music first, like they didn't do what we did and do the corporate path and then feel like eventually, oh my gosh, something's missing. Like maybe for them, it it could like suck the passion out of because it it became just a job and they hadn't seen what it would be like to have their life without music. That's such a good point. Like I wouldn't take back one aspect of my choices mm-hmm. along the way, because through all of those choices, it, it, it caused me to really deeply understand where I am and be grateful for it. Yeah. Yeah. And, I, and I, I recently had somebody on here talking about mental health. And I know that you have gotten some education in, this, in psychology. Like, do you feel like musicians struggle with that a lot because maybe because they're scared, they're unsure, or also they're just putting themselves out there, like you said, and hoping that, you know, they're going to feel like they're enough when people give them the kudos that they're looking for. And then if they don't get that, then they're just feel lost. Well. You know, there was, I used to bartend too. It was like one of my first things and, and serve and be, I'm going to get to your point. Mm. And I remember what I had to go through in the service industry and how um, the different types of personalities and my ego, how it would just be crushed over and over and over again. And when I think at the time, I used to feel like, wow, this sucks more than anything could ever suck. Maybe I'm just terrible at it. And then the same thing with the music industry. I mean, if you know, you know, right? Like people telling you, hey, play Free Bird. We don't like that song. Turn it up, turn it down. Can you make it? You know, you're just constantly asked to be more or different or you're ha- some people love you. One night they'll be like, you know, wow, you're incredible. And then the next night people are asking you to turn it down. You're annoying us. And so inside of that to your question, can it cause mental disturbance. Yes. But in the best of all ways, because uh, musicians tend to have, I'll say thicker skin, but I mean that in a way where you're able to handle all of that judgment. You can, if, if, I'm not saying every, every musician, I'm saying it is an opportunity though for us to, and then in life, when you carry it out in life, and and you meet all these different personalities and some people are going to like you and some people aren't, I feel like there's a strengthening there that can have a deeper acceptance for what is. I think that's true. And I think that, I mean, while I had music experience in college, like maybe if I had gone through kind of the highs and lows of of what you do as a touring artist and all that, that I wouldn't have had maybe some of the problems I had in corporate where I felt you know, like someone saying one thing about something I did could totally crush me, you know? Yeah, yeah, yes. So can't we all relate to that if we were really honest? And to, you know, thick skin, I don't mean for us to put barriers on our heart in order to protect ourselves. I mean to really get that it's okay. Like really, I can keep my heart open to you. I don't have to close to you just because there might be a judgment you have upon me. And that's okay. And Mm. I really feel like that's where we start to get in these unconditional loving places. And that's really the whole point of following your passion is because it offers us the teachings in life that are best suited for our our unique soul. Yeah. Well, I'd love to hear a little bit more about your journey. So when you got into music, like what were you doing in the music industry and how did you kind of then migrate toward even more self-development stuff? Yeah. So when I left the corporate world, it was pretty abrupt to, to when I said earlier, I kind of had this bird's eye view. So I won that moment, actually. I just booked a trip to Bali. I took two weeks off. I went by myself. My mother and my father were like, are you crazy? You can't just go to Bali by yourself. I was really young. And my mom even sent me, I don't know if you guys have seen this movie, Taken. Taken. Mm. So the girl gets kidnapped or something and she's like, look what could happen to you. So there was a lot of just courage to just go do this journey. And when I came back, 
I made this decision, I was going to leave it all. And I'm not making that easy. Listen, it's not for the faint of heart. It took a, a sh- ton of courage to do that because I really left a lot of the material world behind. And uh, But the love that I had for what I was doing superseded that material, you know, kind of short-term filling that I was getting. So uh, from there, here was the in- here's where all the self-development really came into play. It was just an observation of my own experience that when I started pursuing an aligning with what I truly loved, many more things in my life came in that I couldn't have conceived of that were also in alignment and may- or slightly random even, but were still in alignment with that frequency of more passion in my life where I even from there, so because I wasn't, I didn't, I wasn't jaded. You know, I was like, I can't believe I'm getting a check for something I would do for free. I don't care how little the check is. You know, I was just so happy. So even though there was several musicians that would, you know, you get a little jaded, I get it. And they'd be like, well, you're never going to get into that place. Oh, it's so hard to get over. Oh, you don't even know what they're like over there. And then because I was really in joy, especially when I was singing, I ended up getting into a lot of these places. Like, I didn't listen to that. I just, here's a goal. I'm going straight over there. I'm not going to let this interfere. And I, I, it had started happening. And before I knew it, I was even booking for a lot of these places because then I started connecting and I had an ear for what really good music. So I was creating a lot of abundance, not only performing, but now I was booking others and helping others and guiding others because, I, you know, when people would message me, can you guide me? Can you show me? I would be so honored to, right? And it's also be honest with everyone. You know, there is that too. You have to be honest. And so really from there, there was just formulas that I would kind of go into my own personal lab, if you will. And I realized that this didn't, wasn't just fitting for a musician. Yes, it is fitting for a musician, but it's really anyone around what it is to begin to, what does that look like when you defy logic? and start to go into these areas of trusting where your heart's pulling you. Mm. And did you always know that that music was that for you, like even when you were younger? I was. I always knew I couldn't put it into a language. But really, as a young girl, music was this acceptable way to scream. It was an outlet, and it was also a source that connected me to something far beyond what I knew myself to be. Mm. Yeah. yeah. And I think many that are listening could definitely identify with that. Um, yeah. And, it, you know, for some, it may not be music. It may be art. It may be, you know, writing. It may be any of those kind of creative pursuits where you feel like you're truly burying yourself when you do it. Yes. So I, you also do speaking, right? Do you combine that with your music? Yeah. So what ended up happening was they were separate for quite some time. And it was sort of this underground uh, process that I developed that had spread through word of mouth, but it wasn't really presented outwardly in the world. It was just this other business that took on its own life. And what people still just knew me for was uh, being a musician, which was fine. And I didn't really know how to merge the worlds. And I thought if it was going to happen naturally, it just would. And so now, uh, after the year of COVID, I had a little bit of a, we'll say, dark night of the soul, really dark night of the ego, but awakening of the soul where it became more and more clear to fine tune, you know, not doing things for reasons of the ego. And that can be a slippery slope. It really can. We have to be so awake and alert and humble to understand when we're doing that. And so what was born from that was combining the concerts with some, and and really put frequencies, right? We can place intention inside of frequencies and we can prove that with science now. And so I understood how to begin to deepen intentionally placing this love or these certain specific things inside of the the music along with teachings. And so it really started to pull on people's sensories on every level. And so I was able to combine what I did in this other world of self-development into these concerts, which I call them, you know, the the soul slappers. Mm. (laughs) I like it. And and how do you... How do you go about booking that? Do you say this is a music concert or do you say this is a self-development talk or is it something wholly other? 
Yeah, no, it's a concert, but inside of the language within that, there'll be like maybe testimonials. And that's usually the best way people tell you their experience of it. But I will just say it, it invites people into feeling the music more deeply through pulling on the sensory. So we even have people, you know, some hanging from the sky, depending on the music and different interactions with the physical components of even dancers and things. And as far as booking it, one day I looked around and I was just like, you know, I'm not going to wait. Why not just, why not just create this? If you build it, they will come. Mm. And it and again, those are those things. I just went for it and it, it took a ripple effect of its own. And what type of venues are you booking this at? So this particular one, and we're in more conversations now to, to book more here, but Scottsdale Center of Performing Arts, which is one of my favorite theaters. I remember being in there one time and I was looking around watching the performer and I was like, man, I really want to be in here. Mm. And then, you know, that was serendipitously it just collided for the, that big show. Wow, that's cool. That's awesome. So that's one piece of what you do. Like, let's just say like you had to break your income into kind of a pie. Like, how would that come in right now um, as as a musician and self-development person? So I have the self-development work would be just either it's, it's a little more exclusive working one-on-one, -on -one, but I also do retreats. And really those retreats are designed to unveil the, the truth and sort of show, show us inside of what is an illusion. It, they're kind of, they're very intentionally designed in a very specific process where I can also utilize music. Because if you notice, like when we're, we go in with music. I feel like this is a human connection. We can all really relate. There's something that it, the music just taps into something deeply inside of us. When I utilize that component intentionally in a process of a retreat, in alignment with that journey of awakening, it can be very special and a landmark in time where people can then go back into their regular lives and with these new seeds planted. So there's retreats, the concerts. We have a podcast now called Wild Courage because, mm. you know, this shit takes wild courage, you know. So we'll, we'll interview anyone from politicians to psychics to the whole, there's nobody left out. Mm. Yeah. Wow. So that's cool. And I think that's really helpful for, you know, a lot of our audience. They really get into self-development stuff. Um, and they're they're doing that kind of thing on the side and trying to figure out how they can merge that with their music. I think retreats are a great option for that. Absolutely. And, and you know, I think the seed to be taken and planted here is that the whole point of the creativity is not living inside of the box. And so even with music, even though it's done, you know, there's obviously the ways you go do the gigs, you get booked for the gigs, you do the rounds. And I think there's a lot to be said about that because you have to understand the nuts and bolts. And then from there, just opening this space to allow something that's, that people haven't conceived of yet, that, that they really just you being the vessel to something that can only be born through you. And we have to just be so open because it's not given to us in these very linear, linear logical ways. It's just somehow along the path when we're following our heart and we're open, just out of nowhere, sometimes seemingly, we get an idea. And if you can begin to trust in following those ideas versus staying inside of the patterns of comfort, because even in creativity, we can stay inside of the patterns of comfort and then just move towards one little ping at a time. And you don't get to know the next five steps. It'll show you the one step. And then from there, when you lean into those things, then it's the birth of something you can't even conceive of. And not to be grandiose. It's not about always being grandiose. It's simply about following the heart. And then we find ourselves in alignment, which is to say, there's nowhere else I'd rather be. Yeah, it sounds like it does take a lot of um, a lot of following and shifting and things. And I know you have a process called the shift process. Is that is what you just described part of that? Yeah, the shift process, it's pretty, it's pretty interesting. And I'll, I'll tell you, because being a musician, when I was when I was on my path, I had conquered a lot of these goals, and so again, I was always just into self development. I studied it. I was I took every kind of class, read every kind of book. I was just very since a young age. So that was another personal desire that I had to as a maybe philosophy and lover of wisdom. And so one day I'm I'm kind of kicking back and I'm thinking, okay, you've done a lot of these things that you didn't even think was possible, and here you are and and I want to make sure we don't stay in a comfort zone. 
So I remember thinking, what is that gap for you that has you feel separate from, say, this, on these people on these bigger stages where you're like, I'm down here and you're on this big stage. So what is that gap for you? And as I began to investigate the gap, long story short, what I discovered was the brain, as we know, loves patterns. And so we can do all of this growth and sometimes the, it, it, it is designed to keep you where it knows it's familiar. Mm. So I discovered that styling the person based on what these higher frequencies are, then when the brain starts to see you, like physically style you differently, when the brain starts to physically see you differently as you're doing all this inner work, it looks and goes, actually, you are different. Okay, you can pass. Actually, mm. you are different. Okay, you can pass. So from there in my own journey, I saw it to be factually true. And I studied the science behind all of that. And that's when I designed the shift process, which is meant for anybody who has, I mean, we all have goals. We all have things we aspire to, to touch in on. And so it's designed for that. Mm. You know, I had a boss say to me once, after somebody turns 50, it's really hard for them to change. And I'm curious what you think about that. Do you, do you think the shift process can work for people of, of any age? A hundred percent. It it defies that logic because logically he's right. Mm. And there's a lot of evidence you can get, but we're not working with logic. And and as we know, there's a lot of things in science, right, that there is like not logical, but it's still proven. We just don't live our lives as if that's the case. And so once we can walk into a world where there's clarity there, then the brain starts to get on board. It, it age is so insignificant, truly. Mm, that's good to hear, especially because a lot of people that are watching and listening, I know I, try, I attract an older audience. So, you know, there's a lot of people that are wanting to potentially pursue music in later life. You know, they're done with their corporate career, or they raise their kids. But they they don't see themselves as a musician yet. And it's hard for them to to do the things as a musician because they don't see themselves as a musician. So I'm assuming the shift process could help with something like that. Oh, 100 percent. And I will give this little nugget. I tell this to everyone, including myself. I check mm -hmm. in every day. There's one thing that will block everything. And that is the I already know syndrome. So the reason why your boss might have said that but by the way, youngsters get caught in the I already know syndrome just as much. And you know exactly what I'm talking about because we can identify it in ourselves. Oh, yeah, I already know. Oh, yeah, I saw, I read a book like that. Oh, yeah, I took a class like that. Oh, I already know. You're, you're done. You're fixed. You're boxed in. You have to not know every day. Yeah, no, that, that's like very, very anecdotal for me because my daughter's learning how to drive and she's always saying, Oh, I already know that. You know, if we tell her to do something or not do something, I didn't know. That. Well, then why did you do that? You know, right? We get stuck. If you want to pass your test? You got to listen to us. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, I'm curious. You know, with with all the stuff that you've done, do you have any opinions about like women and entrepreneurship? Do you find that doors are more open to women now? Do you find that? you know, there's just a lot more like community for women in entrepreneurship and even musicians who are entrepreneurs. Mm. Well, there's certainly a lot of communities in entrepreneurship for women for sure. So what, what I say, though, is to really, you know, we have to check in with ourselves to see what is best suited for our own personal alignment, because you can find yourselves in places where it's all designed to feed the not enough and, and he, I need to do this to be more than what I am. And we'll never arrive there ever. Because once you get to these grandiose places, the next thought will be, I need this now to be enough. Mm. And so I always just check in with that. Because if you really get that, then you it, sometimes there's these places that attract a lot of people. And you just want to trust yourself if, you f if you're inside of it and you go, this isn't a judgment. This is honesty and discernment for my personal self. This isn't a fit for me. Mm. And so, yes, I, pr I promise there's everything out there for everyone. I mean, I just did a retreat for men. Me, I hosted it and, and just men because there's an opening for men too to really get outside of the programming. We're both programmed on both sides, whether men, women, you know, we we have these, we get boxed into these thought processes that are just life lies. 
So when you're ready, it's true that saying, you know, when the student is ready, the teacher will come. And we're all students of life, all of us. It's not a hierarchy. It's just when you're truly open and ready, I assure you, the thing's going to show up, but probably a couple of decoys first, <laughs> lures, you know? Yeah, but that's <laughs> good because you, you can realize, okay, this is not for me. Okay, this isn't. So wow. it helps you, you narrow the search of what is for you. And trust that. Yes. Yeah, totally. Uh, also curious about kind of the balance between creativity and business for musicians or even anybody that's in kind of the creative world. Did you find that it was hard or did it come naturally to, you know, really embrace the, the business side with not with while well, not squashing your creativity? That's such a good question. Yeah, that's such a great question, especially applying to the world of, of musicians and creatives. That's a slippery slope, that balance. And it's so important. It really what's important is us to clarify what our goals are. And sometimes the goals might be, listen, I just, I love this chill life or I, I have what I need. I don't need to just fight to be, you know, grandiose. I don't need that. And really be clear about that. And if there is gaps for us, it's important that we look, that we're the, the it's your present goal, your present goal that has a glitch around it mm -hmm. that's not aligning you. And because there's some block there. And so, the business aspect for musicians is usually that, especially if we've known to be creatives most of our lives. So for me, I, my dad's an entrepreneur, and sometimes it's just you're just given concoctions within yourself that work, and there's a balance that's more naturally there. And I can say that, sure, there were disciplines I'd have to put in place because I can't tell you how many times I didn't feel like it. And if we really boil it down, that's really the only thing that has to be overcome. It's it's not about whether you feel like it. Whether you feel like it is quite irrelevant. It's just being in integrity with our goals. And so inside of that, everybody's a business person. If you're just knowing that you have, if this is your goal, there's an integral process to stay with your goal. Otherwise, adjust your goal. I like that because, I mean, you can even think about it on the music side. We don't always feel like stepping on stage. No, you know, and it's like, but it's part of my goal to do great performances, to deliver what I promise, to, you know, keep performing. Maybe today I don't feel like it, but I'm going to do it anyway. Totally. Then don't take it our word for it, but let's track our lives. How many times in life do we overcome the I don't feel like it? And we're like, oh, I'm so glad I did that. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm so glad I did times? So many times we could go into our own personal labs. We don't need to take anyone's word for it. It's it's truth. Yeah, that's some great advice. Well, do you have any other advice before we wrap up that you want to give to musicians as far as how they can, you know, really shift and, and move toward that thing that really is that is their passion? Yeah, I would say it can be so important sometimes to just empty ourselves completely, like empty everything that you think you know and you think you are and just start from the empty space and from that empty space there's stillness and from the stillness that's usually where our deepest truths emerge and from that we can make a choice to begin to follow one little thing from that place and it leads to everything we need but I would say we complicate things. We stress ourselves out through unnecessary complications, overly complicating things. So I find that it's really important to just listen, start from scratch, just remove, I know, I know, you know, I know you got it. But take, you can have it back. Just take, empty yourself. And let's just see what the truth is, because you might find that some of the things you've been drawn to for so long, you're just addicted to being drawn to it, and you might not be anymore. So it might be adjusting what you're even drawn to. And if we never get quiet enough, we never know that. And sometimes we're just, you know, grinding away on a path, and it's so hard because you're, it's not fully aligned right now. Yeah, you know, I, I think COVID did that for a lot of people in an unnatural way, but like it caused them to have to stop. And that's why so many people made drastic changes after COVID. They moved to another state. They, you know, quit a job. They, you know, did all kinds of things because they had time to really think through 
where they were at. So I'm curious, are you a fan of meditation then? I'm such a big fan of meditation. And I say the biggest gift you could ever give to yourself is a shitty meditation because what you're showing the mind is like, I know you don't want to do this, but I'm bringing you back. I'm bringing you back. I'm bringing you back. I'm bringing you back. And if you really think about it, that's our one superpower in life is to redirect the mind because all suffering really comes from the mind is sending you in a direction and you're following it down that rabbit hole and it's causing suffering. So if we can get ourselves to center, get yourself back to center, get it over and over and over and over. And meditation allows the space for that centering and that stillness. So yes, I can say that I have gotten my own evidence though, and now have data of many people around me and the work and in my work and that they have now tracked their life, gotten their own evidence. I have the data around it. So I know for sure. And that's why I speak with such confidence. But if you can even get yourself doing, you know, five minutes here and there, it is so valuable. Mm, that's good. That's good. So how can they connect with you online? Are you on social media? Do you have a website? Yeah, I have two websites, the shiftprocess.com and AngelaFerrari.com. Awesome. For social media, Angela Ferrari Official. Angela Ferrari Official. Okay, you guys, go out and connect with her. Um, she speaks a lot of truth here. It, this is, might be even worth listening to again, just to really let sink in some of the things that she said. I thought they were super valuable. So thank you so much, Angela, for sharing with us all of your knowledge and experience today. Thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed it. Thanks for listening to The Profitable Musician Show. I would love to know your takeaways and aha moments from this episode. Leave me a comment over at ProfitableMusician.com so I can bring you more of the information, interviews, and resources that you love. Thanks to Rondi Fay, one of my Academy members, for providing the music for our podcast. You can check her out at RondiFay.com. That's R-A-N-D-I-F-A-Y.com. Just remember, knowledge is power, but without implementation, it is useless. And inspiration without action is merely entertainment. But I know you're not just a dreamer, you are a doer. And I promise I'll be here every week to support you and remind you that you can be a profitable musician. 